Hi, I'm John Root. I'm Emily Payton's campaign collaborator and a uh, admirer and supporter of Trevor uh, for Vermont, Trevor Barlow. And I'm going to pose a few questions to these candidates who are being excluded from the debate. Emily Payton qualified for the election to be a candidate with the Liberty Union Party and Trevor Barlow qualified to be a candidate with an independent signature campaign, so he's an independent, both of whom are legitimate candidates for governor of Vermont. So, Emily, how do you feel about being excluded from the debates by the uh, powers that be in the media? Well, I've been uh, very frustrated, and frustrated on behalf of the people, um, because I know that the people are yearning for a new path, an alternative, and uh, they really don't realize how redundant the system is of keeping the two parties in control. So I've been uh, alternatively angry, I've been alternatively let's make fun of it, and um, I'm happy to be here with Trevor because I just got a chance to speak with John Margolis, who's written very disparagingly about me through This is the Fourth Cycle. And uh, Trevor really shows me the benefit of having a non-confrontational approach. And I somehow approached him just now and said to him, you know, I have a profound platform. He said that I was a one-issue candidate. I said, I have a profound platform, and uh, people really respond to it. And I wondered if you would like to get together, you know, perhaps af after the election. And when I approached him from a likability place, uh, he, he seemed willing to get together and to uh, talk to me as an ultimately qualified candidate with um, particularly useful ideas. So, um, so Trevor, how do you feel about being excluded from the debates? Uh, for, for me, I, I look at my perception of Vermont and the Vermont I grew up in, which was one where I was always taught, because of our rural nature, that there were these amazing people that were kind of hidden in the woods, that you should always be respectful of anyone you come across walking down the street, because some of the more accomplished people you'll meet are some of the more unassuming figures along the street. And so, I, having grown up here, um, adopted that credo as part of my lifestyle with regards to just not that I haven't always had respect for anyone I meet on a human level but just I never underestimate anyone I meet because we all have this unique wonderful story and experience based on you know the sheer time space continuum um, but you know there are some of us who choose unique paths but it doesn't make us any less accomplished um, with regards to our benefits to society. And so with regards to being excluded, uh, I feel like I personally have had <clears throat> a life experience to date that has been a mix of non-mainstream activities as well as mainstream activities because I have a, a thirst for learning about how our world works and always asking why. So. That, to me, with regards to being uh, excluded in a culture that raised me, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm excluded from my home to some extent. That I, I have this feeling that the place that I grew up in and raised me to be a, a functioning, successful human being is now telling me that I, my ideas are not worth enough uh, or worthy enough of being shared publicly. May I uh, add a point to so being a woman has been all along that uh, we want you to be weak and uh, sexual and sensual rather than strong with integrity and with intelligence. 
Um, so this exclusion is sort of uh, the last high wall in a lot of society's exclusion. And again, there's that feeling that I have so much to offer and so much for the good of all and a struggle to share it because of this wall of exclusion. Yeah, I think I, I would like to just follow along uh, Emily's line there with regards to a, a statement having met all of the different candidates out on the campaign trail and got to know them as human beings and not as these media sound bites that gets uh, represented currently is that one, there are some amazingly valid ideas um, that have wonderful modern application, I'll say. And then two is the fact that I think independents um, or people who are not part of either parties tend to get looked at as outsiders or whiners. Um, that you're just there to make noise and cry for, for a minority interest. And I don't think that's true whatsoever. Uh, I think we are involved in the process because we are people of action who know that you need to risk getting out there and sharing your opinions in order to affect change, positive change in our society. And so even though we're talking about the fact that we're disappointed or whatever uh, part of the emotional spectrum we're uh, experiencing, uh, with regards to our exclusion from the, the general conversation, or I would say the greater conversation, uh, we're not whining. <laughs> we're actively involved. We've put ourselves out there publicly because we care that much about this state and about a process that we see is not adequately representing this, the people of the state of Vermont. Right. We're essentially looking to help reinvent the wheel because we hear and we see that the current system is not serving the good of all. So tell me something, uh, Trevor, about the better world that you know in your heart is possible, especially if you were in a position to uh, have the bully pulpit of the governorship and the opportunity for a budget and those things. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, wonderful question. Um, uh, I'd like to start out with saying that I feel privileged to be able to recognize my own privilege. Uh, being a, a white male in a predominantly white state. Um, and even with the recognition of all that privilege, uh, I, I have a hard time living here. And, and once again, I'm not whining. For me, that is recognition that if it is this difficult for me to be in this state, how difficult it is, is it for those who are much less privileged and who have less access to opportunity than myself? Um, it's, it's heartbreaking to me. Um, so with regards to what I would do in affecting change and the good in the world, I would not be involved. If you're a pessimist, you do not run for public office because when you run for public office, you're exposed to all these things, not only about your society around you, but about yourself that you might not have known because you come into contact with people that you might not see every day, um, that you might not choose to interact with every day. And so as far as the opportunity to run for this office and what I would do, it's because I have a generally positive view of Vermonters. I must admit, being involved in the political process, I have a somewhat more negative view of our politics than I had previously, having met a lot of representatives, because I think there's a certain part of this process that either forces you to um, compromise your beliefs and morals, and I'm all for compromise, but to an extent where you have to sell out your character, that is what is really concerning to me. And so if I had the opportunity to serve at, in the leadership of state government, I, I would focus on returning some integrity 
uh, back to the process, as well as enabling the human aspect of it, which is trusting my fellow Vermonters to be capable enough of taking care of themselves if we help them down that path, as opposed to taking away their freedoms and controls and telling them what's best for them. And Emily, what, what does the better world that you know in your heart is possible look like? Well, I think that uh, we should have a much more collaborative system of self-governance. And, uh, for example, there are strengths that, that Trevor has. There are people who have strengths that uh, everybody has a strength, and they know what they need. And as Trevor was speaking to, what we're finding is the legislators act as if they have to take care of, they have to provide fixes for, rather than trusting that the people uh, could come up with the right answers themselves, or if they were more involved intrinsically in the decisions, such as having, uh, having a voice in the votes on the bills. Um, I feel like there's a distrust of the legislator and the bureaucracy of the people. And on top of that, uh, as people may know, uh, this idea that the legislature only is able to tax, spend, and regulate is uh, a very limited view of what the legislature could do um, if it were willing to uh, grapple with the injustice of poverty in a digital monetary system. Uh, there are numerous methods of increasing money in circulation for those who need it the most. Um, I'll call it democratizing money. Uh, we, have, we haven't seen them enacted by a legislature, and I don't know if that's because the banking lobby or the two-party system uh, is so firmly in control. So this is a uh, this is what I want to do. I want people to learn to demand these alternative methods of bringing more money into circulation, such as a public bank, such as having a Vermont credit card where we, we market it to tourists and all the value of those interest payments would go into a treasury. It could fund uh, small communities. Um, and a number of other ways that I think that are the way we finance our government and the way we finance what we are doing has very low integrity, such as sending, uh, sending people away to prison and benefiting a private uh, prison complex when instead we could be doing restorative systems that hire more people locally. Um, you know, these are extensive ideas that uh, I'd like to meet and talk with people uh, throughout the next two years so that you can understand how much, how much we can do that we're not doing right now to alleviate poverty. So one of the media outlets branded the, or maybe not branded, but accused the uh, independent candidates of being single issue and uh, on an ego trip kind of thing and uh, being basically irrelevant. So um, could, could, why don't we start with Emily this time again. Um, could you say a few words about each of the issues that you think are particularly important? All right. That well, a governor could do, that a governor could uh, institute, that a governor could put in motion. Right. Well, I have one single issue, that it be for the good of all, but uh, we shall uh, look at the democratizing money is a whole element of bringing more money in circulation or improving the, uh, the amount that we have available through certain mechanisms that speaks to the economy. Then, of course, we have a restorative approach to our nonviolent criminals. Uh, then, of course, we have an, uh, a nonprofit natural health care system that runs alongside the uh, for-profit system, but 
where we fund a system that people can go to to learn about how food is medicine, to engage in movement is medicine, laughter is medicine, some of the more uh, natural ways that we can restore healthy bodies. Um, then of course, I think that's three so far. And then of course we have uh, education and the concerns that I have about a compliance-based education where children are expected to comply rather than being supported to uh, learn for their passion and as well uh, any sort of removal of the school as a, a foundation of a community is something that really needs to stop. We need these schools um, and I believe there's plenty of money to fund them if we approach our our budget properly. That's for, um, there's of course building community for climate change and I always promote uh, Hempcrete which I believe will do as much work as the uh, solar panels do in that they'll save our buildings about three quarters of the use of fuel and each cubic meter, each cubic yard, sorry, will sequester 185 pounds or so of carbon during its lifetime. So I think the state needs to get involved in funding a, uh, a hemp processing plant that would cost several millions, maybe 16 millions, and that it should belong to the people and the dividends belong to the people uh, in how we can explore that people can get a universal basic dividend from a number of different sources. Those are There's five right there, and yet I've been, as you said, um, named a, a single issue candidate. Trevor. Yes. Uh, things that you were that are close to your heart to accomplish and put in motion as governor? Well, I, I think um, I th there's a bit of irony in being uh, addressed as a single issue candidate for me uh, because of my uh, business experience. I, I feel like I have a good understanding of um, common sense and, and what are realistic goals for serving a two-year term. So during a two-year term as governor, which is a, a whole separate conversation that's still going on politically with regards to what can you truly accomplish at scale in a two-year period. Um, so unless it's technology, which I think is our, our modern exception, but to address kind of the issues um, as far as I see them and what I would focus on, uh, I look at everything through a lens of innovation and that's been the, the issue that I've been accused of, I guess, which I will gladly take that accusation because I think Vermont needs innovation. I think some of the ideas that Emily just shared are extremely innovative. If you socialize those ideas, then they spur more ideas when people feel like they can openly share thoughts they have and creative uh, solutions for solving our problems. So as far as issues, I, I limit myself to a few, even though I have some what I would call smaller items that I think could be bring great benefit. So the first issue is looking at our economy and how we grow it and we expand wealth for all while uh, leveraging the um, rising tide and all, all boats um, will rise together is getting into using tax money, so taking existing money within our budgets and dedicating it to innovation and putting it, I have a pretty lengthy plan about this that people can uh, request either via my website or I'll publish it on social media with regards to our regional development centers and saying let's give each center a million dollars a year for five years and say that money is dedicated towards generating local ideas, so creative ideas. Um, they have a million dollars to invest in people. Ideally, they turn into businesses that locate in those regions and employ people and uh, bring more wealth to the area. As, um, but worst case scenario, we're spurring the creative juices and energies of uh, regions that have felt a bit downtrodden or beaten down by 
a more controlled economic model where Montpelier is telling them how their tax money will be spent as opposed to returning it to them. And there are great people in Montpelier, so I'm not trying to make Montpelier an evil. I'm just using it to be an example of this government um, that is not allowing its people to help itself. Um, the second thing I would look at, like I said, I could dive more into the innovation aspect and in getting into these funds. But the second part I look at is healthcare, because I think if we look at the economic benefits of health and wellness, and even though um, Emily and I might have some different ideas on how to approach it, we see the same problem. And the same problem is that if you don't have a healthy populace, then you create uh, vicious circles, I think. Um, for people, especially for those that are less financially able to care for themselves. Everyone is able to care for themselves in general in a simplistic sense. If you yeah, take care of your physical health, you take care of your mental health, you eat well. We know those are the basic building blocks that really are not that expensive when it comes to lowering health care costs. So as a society, we should be making those things a priority. We don't currently do that very well. And so I think there are programs we can implement leveraging our schools um, to help make those accessible. And then that the third issue that I think I would focus on, um, or not think, but know I would focus on, is with regards to education. I have two elementary age children who are getting good educations in schools, but I've looked at the administrative structure of our schools and kind of the rationale behind Act 46 and the consolidation, and I can't apply any common sense to that model whatsoever. You're going to try to save rural communities by closing their community centers. I mean, ask yourself that. That's essentially what Act 46 is about. It's about saving money for the state, but not really saving communities. Um, and I think if you keep these schools open and you invest in these communities and tell these communities, we believe in you. You've done it before. We have it historically as Vermonters. We have an amazing history of innovation and uh, self-determination. I mean, we talk about freedom and unity. It's the individual freedoms, but working together to solve those problems um, schools, that's, that's it. That's your main place. You want to talk about your main place of creativity and innovation. It's in a child's development through our public education. Let's focus on fixing those things and returning the power back to the individuals at the local level so that then they can bring about change. So to, to roll this all back into um, how we get classified with regards to our value within the conversation uh, for debates as to whether we are fit to govern this state. And I think uh, Emily said it um, so well with regards to it's not about being an individual who can run the state. We are not the heroes or the panacea for all of society's issues. What we come from is the perspective of saying, you know what? There are many voices out there of value that we need to do a better job of incorporating into the discussion, as well as collaborating with to solve our problems, as well as saying that what we would do is trust you, the Vermonter, and, and try to find ways to enable you to take better care of yourselves towards the benefit of all. Um, can I uh, ask uh, you to uh, look at the particular problem of very broad bureaucracy in Vermont. We have about double the amount of bureaucracy and, and half as many, as many people as a neighbor, New Hampshire. And I've run up against this when I've been uh, attempting to begin a small business at a farmer's market. And I found that the health department was uh, deciding that I needed not one but two licenses that kind of contraindicated it were kind of contraindicated and uh, they uh, they get their funding by the amount of licenses that they have to uh, give out so when we have this sort of situation where uh, bureaucracy is funded by its fees and licenses and the 
legislature has let it do that, and yet we could be accomplishing the same goals or we could be encouraging more small business, for example, if we uh, didn't charge fees for these new food businesses coming in, even though they would need to get inspected and pass inspection. How do you handle how do you handle reducing the bureaucracy in Vermont, if that's what you might do? Yeah. Well, my, my personal thought, I guess, is it's twofold. I think the way you reduce bureaucracy is you, you make it an economic discussion. So to your point of what does it take to be a successful and productive member of our society? And I, the reason why I boil it down to that level, because I think that gets into my arguments for lowering taxes, that the reason why taxes are so high right now is because we have such a top-heavy administrative process um, right now in our state, which did not exist 30, 40 years ago. And don't get me wrong, I've been in a variety of discussions, so if we want to talk about breadth of knowledge with regards to Act 60 and Act 250 and getting into you know, our environmental regulations and our business friendliness, and in general, how we uh, address human behavior, because that's ultimately what we're trying to manage and control here to some extent. And, and I see with all these administrative items that it's kind of a, a guilty until proven innocent theory, which is contradictory to our, and, and I also look at it through the lens of, are you punishing a majority for the sins of a minority? And those are difficult concepts to embrace because bad things happen. <laughs> and, and I don't think we can prevent all bad things, but we need to return back to that trust of the individual, that we would not be a functioning society if the majority of us on a daily basis didn't make more positive than negative decisions mm -hmm. in our life mm -hmm. and make decisions that were in our own best interests. So I would, I would argue to your, to your point um, and agree with you that we don't need as much administration as we have. If we trust human beings to make the right decision, which majority of the time they'll do because it's in our best interest, we have a survival instinct within us that is visceral, then you will get positive outcomes. And so I think we can get to a point, especially in this day and age with technology, where we can better measure the impacts of human behavior. And then through that measurement that will improve over time, decide how we best apply our resources to the areas of of um, the areas where there are problems that need solutions. So if we boil it down to your example, which I think is wonderful, the, the challenge of small business. Starting a small business is infinitely difficult because of beyond what can just happen on a day-to-day -day basis that may be out of your control. If you add multiple layers of bureaucracy or administration into that mix, it becomes a very daunting task for to uh, in an activity that, in my mind, is encouraging individuals to take risk in order to take care of themselves mm -hmm. and to control their own environment. So, uh, jump in if you have uh, something yeah, to say. Been, we've been campaigning together for quite a while, and I'm wondering if any of the ideas about uh, monetary policy, about increasing our money in circulation, um, ring true. Uh, absolutely. So <clears throat> I will say it's been more recently that I've become aware of, uh, of your ideas with regards to uh, leveraging financial tools, existing financial tools. So a banking methodology, we'll call it, with regards to a state bank, um, uh, a credit methodology with regards to creating a, a state-sponsored credit card. Um, and the those ideas to me are beautiful in the sense that they leverage existing systems and market systems because a lot of people nowadays, the word socialist gets thrown around, especially right. with regards to Vermont. Right. And it's saying, no, we respect market mechanisms because I think there's a strong logic there uh, if they're properly managed mm -hmm. and if they're beneficial to everyone. And I know we've talked off camera many times about 
my disappointment with the win at all cost culture, mm -hmm. which I think business can promote, uh, unfortunately, which then creates absolute winners and absolute losers as opposed to creating a win-win situation right. for all. So to add one of my ideas to the mix as along those lines, when I talk about creating innovation funds that are administered through these development um, corporations around the state, we have 12 of them, and having them be processed through innovation centers, so we're actually funding ideas and funding businesses in these communities, along with that, I would like to have Vermonters be able to co-invest and be able to say that as part of these innovation funds, both corporate entities and private individuals can invest whatever amount small amounts of money, it could be $5, so that whatever benefits are created from these funds and these activities mm -hmm. get returned to the general populace. Mm -hmm. And so I think, along with your ideas, we, we work along those same lines logically with regards to if you allow people and you empower them to participate and you reward them as opposed to penalizing them and start to create systems that benefit all Vermonters as opposed to this adversarial model of win at all costs. It's a, it's a better way to um, manage your society and I think it's a, a, a better way to set up positive outcomes for, for everyone. So, uh, Emily, one of the things that really intrigued me was the idea of a nurturing economy. And I have the impression that Trevor just addressed that. Could you say something about how to create a nurturing economy? Yeah, I, one of the things that uh, I'm an idea person, I'm also a person of action. Um, so ideas uh, and visions of how we can go forward come very, spring very easily to me. And uh, I recognize that they are just a seed. And then when they're tended by lots of people, if they take, then they, they evolve. Um, so one, one seed that I think would be very beautiful to see come to fruition would be offering a path for people who are now in universities or schooling or of that age to be able to invest sweat equity into community building as an actual building houses from natural materials that help us deal with climate change that are also passively oriented. So bringing the, the brilliance of the zero waste community forward and the, all the um, technology that we can do to reduce waste, uh, LED lightings and so forth, and even composting systems. So in, as an opportunity that we can offer these young people to, instead of maybe being in a beer pong game or maybe in addition, to go and actually hands-on build these communities from bottom up, possibly using land that we've seized in a tax sale or something like a, uh, a uh, dairy farm or some other, and have their sweat equity translate into residential rights. And if we do this uh, around the state, uh, then we're creating communities that can also have alternative currencies that also reduce our, uh, our problems of isolation that have been coming since the Industrial Revolution that uh, help us reweave the fabric of society. Um, I think this idea and this plan has merit uh, when I talk about it, of course, in terms of a political platform it seems way outside of the box. Um, but what we see is the, the millennials are, are saddled with so much debt. Uh, it's almost impossible for them to have land. And we're, we've destroyed communities so much with the, uh, this debt-based monetary system and people are working two, three, four jobs sometimes. And now, on top of it, these people have to uh, pay their school debt. Um, so I, I think um, being able to be uh, 
at least plant a seed of let's, let's allow ourselves to be creative. Let's allow ourselves some room to solve things in, in a creative way that uh, ultimately allows us to be more human and has our experience of fulfilling our purpose and integrating with each other in a loving, caring way ought to be the benchmark of our success, um, probably over our gross domestic output. Um, so that there's a, that's a little bit of a piece of my mind. So uh, Trevor, what are your plans for the next two years? The, the existing media situation has basically said you're not, you have no chance, we're not covering you, we're not giving you the, the, uh, the, <clears throat> we're not giving your ideas the opportunity for people to respond, right? We're just, nobody knows about you basically unless they meet you at some event. So what are your plans for the next two years? As far as politically, I, I plan to stay involved uh, on a community level because I was, that was part of what spurred me into uh, putting my proverbial name in the hat for this, uh, this, this election cycle was that I was involved in a lot of community groups and programs and starting to really understand um, the shortcomings, I guess, of, of the application and the administration there with school, healthcare, uh, business development in, in Vermont. So um, I would say my, my knee-jerk response uh, or visceral response would be I plan to stay involved. Um, I also plan to see what the actual outcomes are of this election because I have been using non-traditional channels to reach out to people, which is, I guess, non-traditional now, but used to be traditional once upon a time, which is getting out there and traveling around the state and actually meeting people and not doing it with a lot of fanfare, but trying to leverage our digital tools through social media to at least document that, hey, I'm out there and I care and I've invested a significant amount of time and thought into this campaign um, right now. So regardless of outcome, uh, even though I will say there's a little voice in me that's still playing hard till the end from maybe an underdog upbringing um, that I think there's always a chance, but uh, pending the actual outcome, I, I plan to stay involved and plan to try to see how post-election I can maintain a voice um, that's more significant within the state as far as still pushing to get these ideas forward of how we can improve the state because I, I'm not doing this for for personal gain right now. You know, I purposefully, and I think Emily can make some wonderful statements about that as well, have chosen not to raise significant amounts of money. I've raised small amounts of money from people that are near and dear to my heart, kind of the proverbial, what we would call in the business world, friends and family round, um, to explore this political process and see if my personal thesis um, which is, can you win without having to buy the voters of Vermont? Can you do it through hard work? And I know if I do not have, win the election, that a lot of it will be due to um, constraints that I placed on myself with regards to time and how long I've had my voice out there publicly. Uh, but I do plan to continue and see if there is um, a different route towards I guess winning ultimately in the next round and by winning I mean winning over uh, the people of Vermont and trying to return to what I consider to be the heart and soul of Vermont which is uh, valuing the individual, valuing the individual's capacity to be productive and creative and affect change that's better for all of us if we collaborate. So Emily, what are you planning to do for the next two years? Ah, well, uh, it's time for a little bit of fun. Uh, what happens in a election cycles? And I start out having some fun, and then it, it gets to be a little bit more serious and more serious. And uh, I have a funny bone side to my nature, and a circle of friends who are performers and playwrights, and I've written plays before, so one thing I'm looking forward to 
is writing a political comedy and uh, performing it. Also uh, working on a book as well, Diary of a Suppressed Activist or something. And uh, when the weather is getting better, we're uh, starting to build a, a tiny house with hempcrete. And I'm working on a design um, that I uh, would like to see come to fruition that will be um, totally self-sufficient in terms of uh, gathering water, uh, having composting systems that uh, are also carbon negative. That could be a model for housing homeless people, which has been uh, an area of passion for me. And if I move forward, I'd like to, and I will be moving forward, like Trevor, uh, doing this sort of person-to-person -person outreach and, and learning to get comfortable with being a, a, a leader. And uh, so could we raise money in, in lieu of raising money for signs and advertising? Uh, would it be actually more prudent to raise money for a nonprofit that builds houses for homeless people or uh, engages the people who are in prison to learn how to build their houses so that when they come out they have housing that's not again a burden on the state and we didn't really get to talk to maybe another another interview we could talk about um, the, the the knot that has become our either entitlement or our welfare state and how it's uh, it's just not working very well but I, I will say that for another time so um, I'll be working on uh, building and designing these tiny houses uh, working on a comedy and uh, also uh, the book what was the title of the book again? I hate it's a working title. I mean, I was thinking Diary of a Suppressed Activist. I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll okay. have to see. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. I appreciated that uh, candor. I've also thrown my hat in for 2020 <laughs> already. Uh huh. Because yes. I'm just going to, you know, we're going to just, and I would love to see if we could do, uh, you, you mentioned these um, signs where you have a bunch of people on a sign. I'd like to team up with the best people that I've found and put a, a, a ticket of a team, a team ticket. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I, I, I must say, um, one, I feel privileged to have, as I mentioned earlier, being privileged, but I feel even more privileged um, to have been able to participate in this process. I mean, that is one thing about Vermont that I do so appreciate, even beyond the feeling, the exclusionary um, actions, I guess, that I've, I've witnessed, uh, you are still encouraged in this state to participate. Uh, when I went out there initially collecting signatures, uh, the majority of commentary was, it's always great to have another voice in the mix, more than happy to support you whether I agree with you or not, and kind of getting back to that more respectful conversation. So I definitely look forward to maintaining a relationship with someone who I hadn't known prior to undertaking uh, this election, Emily, as well as the, some of the other independent candidates. And frankly, I hope we're at least on the radar of the uh, Democratic and Republican candidates because I think they are good people as well who have good ideas, and I hope that we can all work together uh, between now and then to do a better job of incorporating these ideas towards the benefit of all of us. So uh, thank you very much for that opportunity. So maybe one last question. Um, say something about the difference between the ideas that you're advocating for and the position that you're aiming for. So what is the difference in, uh, in, in why you, from a certain point of view? Why not just the ideas, or why not just you and forget about the ideas? What is that difference? What is it that makes the, that creates the ambition to become governor? I think for me, it's, it's the voice, and it's uh, who you are as a person. And you have to have a certain amount of self-confidence, obviously, to even put yourself through this process and to say that 
I think I could be a wonderfully representative voice of the population at large. Um, I also think there needs to be a significant amount of uh, humbleness there as well with regards to saying that even though because of the structure of our government I might be one of the primary voices, it doesn't necessarily mean that I am the sole source of all the solutions to our problems. Um, it's a, a matter of saying I have specific ideas that I think have merit based on my experience that I would like to push forward and see adopted. But that does not uh, mean that it's to the exclusion of other ideas that are out there or modifications to my own ideas that might arrive at better outcomes. I think I know I personally um, try to look in the mirror daily to keep my ego in check and not in a way of saying I am hungry for power. No, I'm, I'm hungry for change for all of us, uh, myself included but more so for all of us because I gain the greatest satisfaction from seeing my everyday activities benefit others. Hmm, the difference between the policies that I'm You're advocating for. Advocating and the... And the motivation to be the governor to implement them. Well, my motivation to be governor is really I've been looking for leadership that has a, a much stronger backbone uh, that really speaks to the indignity that we feel when uh, we see executive actions that are uh, acting in a deplorable way, uh, making children and families kidnapped from one another is one example, but there are plenty. So um, I have a very deep sense of fairness, uh, economic fairness, and also a belief that people who are encouraged to be freer will enhance my life. And I have a, a foundation of trust that when people are freer, that they are happier and they are more of a joy to be around. So. Um, I that's what I have that's been lacking in the in the leadership that I see it's uh, they as we've spoken it seems like the leadership will continually compromise towards the party and uh, I really feel like we need a woman a woman who can speak to the amount of fairness and the amount of balance, what I call balance, that's needed. Um, and if we can, uh, that's why I'm seeking the, the governorship. And you know, as you can see, you can see me stumble a little bit, you know, because it's, um, it's a difficult role. It really hasn't been modeled often to be a, a woman leader and to uh, speak with clarity. Sometimes you'll see me trip over my words, but um, my heart is absolutely clear and I'm struggling with myself to be more articulate and more confident um, because these are the changes that I believe will be for the good of all that I'd like to experience. I'd like to experience the people being much freer, being uh, freer of the burden of debt and free to heal the world, really. So that's the, that's why I want to be governor. Good, thank you very much. This was very enlightening and it's so refreshing to have such a different view and understanding of what it's really all about. That was wonderful, I appreciate it greatly.